So a couple logistics before we get going. Uh, we have these right outside this door. If I forget at the end to, re to mention that again, please remind me. Um, this book is about AppSensor. This is kind of a kind of Reader's Digest version for the CISO. Okay, this is Reader's Digest version for CISO. So please pick those up. We want them gone. Uh, take a couple copies if you want. Uh, there, this is an OWASP project, so all open source, no pitch anywhere in here. Uh, so rest assured that's the case. Uh, if you have questions here in the middle, feel free to flag me down. I guess logistically try to grab a mic um, or just holler. Okay, a couple questions for the group. Uh, anybody ever heard of AppSensor? Wow, cool, all right. Uh, and uh, who would consider themselves doing something akin to DevOps-ish in their organization? Yes, ah, okay, a few. Very good, so this will be a learning experience for some of you. Um, and then the breakdown of developer, security, or other. Developer, security, and something else. All right, I see that hand. All right, perfect. <clears throat> So AppSensor is a bit of a unique project within OWASP. It's kind of an idea and a tool. Uh, the idea is covered in this fantastic book, uh, primarily written by Colin over there on the front row. It's a large book available as a PDF. You can print it from Lulu. Uh, but it kind of describes the overarching concept and, and uh, structure of what you can do. Right? There's a big world of what the AppSensor idea can cover. And then there's the tool, which is the implementation piece that I work on, which is some subset of the big idea, right? So to start with, where are we? Well, this will be the agenda. So who? Um, so to help you kind of build a mental model about what we're going to be talking about, this is kind of the base that we're starting from. So Network IDS has some concept here, so that'll help you frame some of the uh, terminology we're going to talk about. Intrusion prevention is in there. If you've ever done fraud detection, you know, with finance, uh, you're going to be used to those kind of things. There's a little bit of concepts from rules engines, uh, HIDs even, so, <clears throat> and there's a talk on risk analysis and reduction done by Dennis Groves at AppSec. You can probably dig up the video that's kind of helpful for explaining the high level here. Terminology, I'll try to keep it uh, short, but these are going to be kind of important when we get to the diagram. So, uh, an event in AppSensor. So this is somewhat IDS-ish. Um, and we do have a longer form glossary if you kind of get interested and want to go read about it. Uh, an event is something that's suspicious, but not, not necessarily bad, but we think it might be bad in aggregate. An attack is one to many events that we have now determined have crossed some threshold into badness. A response is one to one for an attack. So we'll talk more about what that means, but there's a one to one. And then a detection point is just the place where you look for bad things that are happening or suspicious events. Okay, so this is kind of the sales pitchy part for the idea. So this is, <clears throat> I went back through emails and the web and whatnot, and this is kind of what I grokked from my point of view of five years ago what dev looked like. So kind of a history lesson or reminder. So I won't mention everything here, but one thing I'll mention is AWS was just kind of starting, right? Uh, the cloud hype cycle, if anybody remembers, ev nobody knew what cloud was because everybody called it something different. A normal web app was the cloud for some people. Uh, so this was around when NIST defined what the cloud meant. Um, mobile had actually j just started. Um, Ajax was kind of been around for a year uh, and us calling it that. Uh, big data was starting to come online. Uh, to now, where these are terms in my day-to-day -day life that I see constantly, right? It's a little bit buzzwordy, um, but this is different, right? This is not the same as it was five years ago. And importantly, out of that list, everything that I see here that's underlined has to do with one of these issues, right? Trying to solve and think about one of these problems or address one of these problems of either scale, I've got to be able to move quicker with my business, um, I've moved to the cloud or I'm doing something with the cloud or because of those events, I now lack some form of environmental access that I used to have when it was in my data center. Um, <clears throat> so dev buzzwords, these are some of the companies uh, that you probably see in this space that are building tools that you probably recognize day to day that you're dealing with. 
Um, I'm not advertising for any of these. I'm just pointing them out for recognition's sake. Um, so for instance, Kafka, right, to, to kind of emphasize the scale that we're dealing with, this was pulled from a blog post um, on Kafka, and it's recently got updated. So uh, Kafka sees one point uh, at LinkedIn, their usage of Kafka, if you're not familiar, Kafka is a uh, roughly a message queue. Um, that's a horrible, horrible uh, high level overview, but you can think of it that way. 1.1 trillion messages per day, um, and they were, they're processing around 15 million messages per second. Um, so I don't know about you, but most security products probably aren't dealing with this level of problem. So, um, but because we have more data and we're, we've moved to a different environment, we probably have to think about that. So <clears throat> again, this is a somewhat jaded view. Uh, this is my view, not everybody else's. But this is the types of things that I think that we've accomplished in the last five years, at least in the world that I've lived in. So we've done some great things, right? A9 came out, uh, if you're familiar with OS Top 10, we've talked about third-party libraries started in 2013, right? We've made significant progress there where five years ago we didn't think about it, or most organizations didn't. Um, we've got a tool, a bit of a pitch for that within OWASP, OWASP called Dependency Check that's done a great job trying to address this problem. So we've made some movement there. Uh, we've invented these things called bug bounties. Um, we've had uh, SAS and DAST, if you're familiar with that product space, that has evolved. Another OWASP project there would be Zap. Um, they're doing some interesting things. <clears throat> uh, we talked about automatic encoding, another OWASP project there. Um, and, and we've just addressed some of these problems, right? Uh, Netflix has done some pretty interesting things here and they've open sourced them. Um, we've made movement in the CI, CD space with security. We've started plugging into the pipeline. That's a great way to meet developers. Uh, this is my particular view, but I think it's, it's reasonably rational. So dev is doing things that let them move faster to make business impact, right? And that's always what dev has done, right? Dev has to support the business or they're not making money. They're not gonna get paid if they're not doing things to help the business. Security, we are basically iterating on existing solutions that we've already had, trying to make those better fill gaps where, where need be. Um, and we're looking at problems that we haven't tackled before and trying to solve some portion of them. Uh, so my proposal is, and you've heard this a lot the last two days at this conference, um, losing all this and moving to an environment where you have to deal with these problems is a benefit, net benefit for security, not a detriment, right? If you're, you know, I'll just throw you in the classic security bucket. If you're in that world, this probably scares you, but the type of innovation that it forces you to go through, right? We've heard this in the DevOps track a lot. The type of innovation that you have to go through, um, it, it changes your business model on security and, and you have to get comfortable with some things, but it gives you huge improvements, right? There was a talk uh, into it, right, earlier this week, or yesterday, I think, that was really good and touched on a lot of these issues. So the elevator pitch for AppSensor. Um, so I won't talk about all these, but security cannot scale without the dev and operations team. I think that's ground truth that we all should agree to at this point, right? If you disagree with that, talk to most anybody else here at the conference. I think they'll, they'll probably uh, help you see the, see the light. When possible, automated response better than manual response, right? And that's not knocking ops teams. That's saying that they have a lot to deal with. Uh, security teams have a lot to deal with. So where we can automate things, we should, right? That's no brainer. Um, we talk about IDS primitives. Conceptually, we want to uh, the App Sensor project is about thinking about events, attacks, those kind of things. We want to make those available at the app layer. Uh, this picture is kind of what App Sensor is about, right? The attacker takes this long to perform a successful attack. They're going to try a lot of things, but they it take this long to perform a successful attack. We want to stop them at some point before that. That's that's kind of the idea behind App Sensor. Um, and then on top of that, you heard in the keynote, self-protecting applications. There was a slightly different bent on it in the keynote, but that's kind of how we try to talk about AppSensor. Um, and then, you know, we benefit from other work that we do. All right, so I apologize for these pictures. They're probably not fantastic. Hopefully, what you get out of these is the boxes. So if you can see these boxes in the back, yes, no, good. Maybe not the words, but the boxes are good, okay. So I'll talk to the boxes. So this is the basic AppSensor idea. 
an application, whatever that is in your world, mobile, web, desktop, whatever that is, sends suspicious events to a box called AppSensor. AppSensor, based on some intelligence, makes a decision of this collection of events and analyzes and says, okay, at some point that's now, I've got enough events to decide that was an attack. And then based on that, I signal back to the application itself, you have an attacker and you need to do something about it and this is the response that you should take. Okay, so this is in a nutshell. Uh, this is the sequence diagram for that, for those that are so natured. Uh, slightly broken out view. Um, so this is kind of in the reference implementation. Most of these pictures are now about moving into the reference implementation and thinking about what that looks like. So <clears throat> you have, sorry, I'm trying to stay in front of the mic here. Uh, you have a WAF. Uh, network intrusion detection, your own applications, like whatever your systems are, right? We don't really care. We just provide integration points. So you have some set of systems that are able to detect, ev detect events or attacks, right? Maybe your WAF can detect attacks and then signal that into the infrastructure. So something is signaling in data to AppSensor. AppSensor uses some, right now it's a policy mechanism. So it's static, right? You define some policy, your security organization defines a policy and makes <clears throat> AppSensor uses that policy to make decisions, and then it will event that data out, so responses get piped back to the original application or wh whomever you want to notify, and then it will signal that data out to whoever you want to notify. So if you've got visualization tools, if you've got um, a SIM or analytics or whatever you want to do with it, right? We're just kind of data courier. Um, slightly further, so go back one slide. That circle in the middle, AppSensor, this is a breakout of it. Um, data comes in, and this is super high-level architecture, but data goes into these data stores, whatever you want them to be, whatever the implementation is, and then we have listeners on the data stores, right? And our listeners are basically broken up into analysis engines and reporting engines is what we call them. Uh, this would be analysis engines are things that look at data, make decisions, and probably write back to the data store in some way. Reporting engine is everything else that just takes the data and does something else with it. So you can signal off to, we've got integrations with a lot of different tool sets. Um, okay, so emitters, uh, we have a lot of different, this is just kind of a super high level, this is what we support now. It's really straightforward and easy to integrate into whatever your organization uses. If you have something that you want, uh, bug me and I'll, I'll do it or somebody on our team will. Um, so uh, WebSocket tends to be useful. We got Elk and InfluxDB done as uh, part of the OWASP Summer of Code here the last six weeks, so that was pretty cool. We got a, um, a student to do this. That was fantastic. Um, for framework integration, I'll talk a bit more about this later. This is, this is one of the weak points with the reference implementation, to be honest, right now, um, because everybody has a framework, right, and all of them are different, and trying to integrate into those frameworks is a lot of legwork. So once you do it once, that you don't have to worry about it again, but, but there's some work to do there. So we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, storage, config, communication mode. So communication mode, we, we spent a lot of time in the last six months doing this work because as we talked to people that were using the product, they kind of said, okay, we're using this in our enterprise, we're using this in our startup, we're using this in wherever, we need support for this, we're not gonna build it. Um, you know, we're not gonna build all of the hooks, you should have some canned ones. So we implemented a bunch of canned ones. Uh, they seem to work. Okay, a bit more technical. Um, I have, I'm about halfway through the slides and then I have a demo at the end. So we're making, we're doing well on time. Um, <clears throat> so who recognizes this? Can speak intelligently to it? Yes, no, okay. <laughs> Sorry, hands went down. All right, so th this is an HTTP request. Um, this is kind of what your browser's sending. This is what it looks like. I'm not quizzing you on this at the end, so you know, don't feel that you have to pay that much attention. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as an attacker, the things you might want to fiddle with to you know, perform some change and, and get what you want, get whatever outcome you want, these are a few things that you can tweak. And <clears throat> lots of applications don't do checks to make sure that these are correct, right? This, isn't, this is the things that you can tweak as an attacker that the application developer has to end up worrying about in whatever their backend framework is that's processing this stuff. So um, I picked a really simple, straightforward example that hopefully everybody can 
<clears throat> um, can relate to in their day-to-day -day lives, which is I'm gonna, account, I'm gonna transfer money from account A to B, I'm gonna transfer some dollar amount. <clears throat> so we have some account number here, right? Whatever that is, if you're sending that across the wire, by the way, this is not meant to be production code, just so <laughs> nobody gets on me. I, I understand this is not how you should do it, but uh, it's for the sake of argument. So a little bit of code, don't get scared. This is not real code actually, um, it's pseudocode, so just try to, try to track with me for a minute. So we have some function, some backend method that's handling this request, right? And it's going to do a transfer. It's gonna transfer money from one account to another account, some dollar amount. And then when it's done, it's gonna say, okay, I did that work. So if we're gonna let somebody tweak the account number, right? Because when you send data from your browser to the server, you can change whatever you want. So it's probably a good idea for us to make sure that the person who's uh, logged in right now who's performing this transaction owns the account that they're sending money from that would probably be a bad thing if I can send money from your account somewhere else that's that's probably a bug so we want to check if that user owns that um, so this is the net of AppSensor right if you're gonna do custom plugins for AppSensor in your application right if you want to use this infrastructure and you want to do it in a custom way not just relying on some framework integration this is kind of the net of it so in a normal app you know more code but simply this is kind of what you're gonna do in this else block you would also probably have um, you, you would probably already have an else if, if that condition doesn't match, you gotta notify the user, right? You have to send some error message to the screen and tell the user, hey, you can't do that. Um, but importantly, uh, I should stop at this point and, and, and point out, if, we, if you have this, AppSensor probably is not going to help you, right? If you don't do a check at all, your code is so broken, I can't fix it, right? Like, you should, the bar for AppSensor is you're doing some secure SDLC, right? And I understand not every organization is there yet, right? But AppSensor is, is, is a thing you can add, but that's kind of a pre uh, precursor. So sorry if that hurts feelings, but that's, that's what it is. So this is pretty straightforward. Hopefully it's simple. ACE2, don't worry about that. That's just uh, identifier um, notifying us of what the unique ID is. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit. So we're saying app sensor is some, some thing. I want to add an event to it. And what this will translate to, depending on your, um, the way you set app sensor up is, I'm gonna send a rest request to app sensor. I'm gonna fire off something to a message queue that drops an event on the wire and then notifies app sensor and then app sensor continues to do its thing. So from the application side, basically I'm looking at places where I think an attacker might try to, to, to do badness and I just notify whenever I see these things, right? So there's lots of approaches I can take then to plugging these things in. So I can look at doing it manually, right? This is one option. I can actually change the code. I can look at um, building libraries. So anybody heard of a SAPI? The failed, or the, not failed, sorry. Um, uh, quarantine, what, what, what do they call it? Defunct, yeah, sorry. I'm not trying to knock the project leaders of that, but. Um, it, it's come under fire a little bit here lately. Anyhow, it's a enterprise security API, right? Um, and ISAPI has built into it, that's actually where AppSensor started six years ago. ISAPI has built into it this concept of intrusion detection. So in ISAPI, when you do input validation, if it fails, it notifies an internal thing in the ISAPI system that says, you know, uh, intrusion event. Right, so it passes this thing that says a, a bad thing happened when you were trying to do input validation. So ISAPI has some very, very limited things that it can do like uh, log this data. Uh, so AppSensor was built originally as a drop-in replacement for that component of ISAPI and it's, and it's expanded from there. So uh, what are the ways that we can build these events? Because this is kind of the legwork, right? When you want to integrate the reference implementation, as of now, this is the legwork. You've got to either add custom code or you have to use one of our libraries if we support your framework as of now. If not, we'll try to add support. Um, but this is, this is the work. So as a help to this problem, um, I wanted to talk about a couple different things. One is the OWASP Beside project, so that's led by uh, Dr. Chu here on the front row. Um, 
it's a group from my alma mater, UNC Charlotte. This is another project that came out of there. It is a secure programming IDE plugin. It does have a bit of an academic bent because they used it there, but it does provide value. And it, one of the things that it first started with was, hey, can I teach students or whomever is using the tool, can I teach them while they're going, if they pull in data straight off the request, can I tell them, hey, that's, that's bad? Or if I write data that came from the request straight to the database, right? We all know that's bad. Can we make the IDE tell us that's bad? Um, and can we force them to use safe libraries? So there's this concept that it will help you, um, that it will kind of tell you, do this thing as you're typing, right? So there's the project link for it. So I'm gonna speed through these. Uh, I test, I understand, just I'll talk through it. So what's happening here is you are pulling data in um, and you're basically pulling data in and it's wanting you to do input validation. It's wanting you to test the data that's coming in and make sure that it's okay and ensure that you've checked it. So <clears throat> this is a SAPI code that's pulling this in and because we're using a SAPI and we know kind of what the validation rules are for a SAPI, then we know that, hey, if it goes outside these bounds, we can mark that as being a bad thing that we need to notify about. So. Uh, this is the particular bad data that's coming in, and this is what it'll look like in a side. So we get this particular bad data, we're typing it in, it does its thing, and it will drop down for us, what do you want to do about that, right? So I want to sense one of these events that I think is possibly malicious. And then it will wrap this with this exception um, that signals to a side for you. So, so the net benefit here is I don't have to necessarily remember in every single place throughout my application to do this custom thing, right? I have, my IDE tells me as I'm going, hey, this is a good opportunity for you to, to make some signal and it'll wrap it for you. Um, this is a handful of the things they support. Pull the slide deck down, I'll post it in, in a bit and uh, pull the slide deck down and read those, that's great. So, <clears throat> yes, that's what I just talked about. So the second thing I kind of want to, um, uh, cheer on is the Summer of Code, Summer of Code Sprint, I think it was. So OWASP funded, uh, you've probably all he heard of the Google Summer of Code. We've done that in the last few years. Um, that's a, it's a fantastic thing. We didn't do it this year. Uh, not exactly sure why OWASP wasn't accepted, but we weren't. So OWASP put, its, put up its own money to pay students to come in and do work on our projects, right? And so we got, uh, we were the beneficiaries of that in, um, App Center. So we got two things done in six weeks, which is actually pretty impressive for a student who is still in school and had never worked with these technologies before, never started on App Sensor. So a bit of a sales pitch that it's not that hard. Um, he was able to take all of our data that we report, push it into the Elk stack, if you're familiar, Elasticsearch log stash Kibana. It's basically a reporting tool, or that's what we were using it for. Um, and then another path to kind of the same thing of visualization is InfluxDB, which is a time series database, and then Grafana, which is a dashboarding uh, system. So I'll try to speed through these a little bit as well. Um, this is what his machine looked like while he was doing that work. Uh, this is him setting up the queries for it. Again, you're not gonna understand that. And this is kind of what that data looks like, right? <laughs> this is, uh, again, all of the, the, the signals that you're seeing in this presentation, I apologize, are somewhat on dummy data that he needed, so I produced it, and that's why it doesn't look so great, but I promise it still works. Um, this is the, the final for Kibana. So for Grafana, same type of deal, same data set, it's just producing these pretty graphs. Right, so, ooh, ah. Okay, so machine learning. Um, so this is an area we kinda wanna explore. If we have any folks who focus on machine learning in the room, please come talk to me later. If you know people, let me know. Um, so like I said before, what we do now is uh, policy driven, which means you kind of define this spec that says something to the effect of, if I see 30 of this type of event in 10 minutes from the same user, that's badness, right? You have to define some layer to tell our analysis what to look for, right? And then we, we, store, we check the data store as new events come in and, and make decisions on based, based on whether that policy has, uh, that threshold defined in the policy has been crossed but that's, right, that's statically defined. You can go down the path of giving people a UI to change that over time, that's fine, but somebody smart has to 
define that policy, right? And I still think there's tons of value there because if you know your application and particularly if you know what the runtime, what your application looks like at runtime, then you can set that. Um, actually, a good time for a question. Who feels confident they know what's happening in their applications at runtime? <laughs> awesome. That is true for everybody, even, including me. Yes. Yeah, I was trying to promote hand raising. Sorry. Um, who knows? <laughs> no. Uh, so yeah, I think that's most of us, right? And that's kind of sad, right? I mean, I think we can be honest. That we should know, we should know more, right? And I think the last couple of days, what I've seen a lot of is the people that are doing a great job that we kind of look up to and respect. A lot of the, their work has been in monitoring. You can't solve what you don't know is happening. Right? So that's part of what this is about. We're trying to use machines to tell us to an extent, okay, this is happening live right now. We have ops tools that do that to an extent, but I think that's, a, that's an area we should really explore. Um, so if you're not familiar with what machine learning is, um, there's a lot of complex complexity there, but there's also simple versions of the same thing. It's just basically um, behavioral modeling you look at something, it's, if you've ever put a WAF in learning mode, you could call that machine learning. It looks at the data for a while. It defines what normal is and then looks for aberrations. So we're exploring using this for some can set of things that we can check for. Um, and obviously, this, that's the tough bit of machine learning is figuring out what works, right? Um, but uh, because I have a relationship with UNC Charlotte, same people that did aside, they have a PhD student that they loaned me for a little bit to do some of this. Um, he built a uh, very, very simple manual machine learning algorithm that does this. So pretty pictures are good to look at. Top left is normal, right? Again, contrived data set. I'm not arguing that this is real in any way. Um, but if you can see the, gr the angle of the graph there, right? This is my assumption of what data looks like for some given application, right? This would be an application, probably an internal app that is used by internal folks um, and has some form of strong authentication. So, right, we pretty much guarantee that only the people inside the company are using it. We're gonna see trends where it goes up in the morning, then it drops off at lunchtime, and then people get that lunch burst after their coffee, and then it trails off through the night, right? That's what I'm assuming is happening. Um, so something like somebody logging in and producing a bunch of traffic or usage of the application in the top right early in the morning or traffic suddenly dropping, right? You probably, that's probably where the site went down in the afternoon or something like that. Um, those types of things we, sh we, we can track, right? If, if we put the right analysis in place. This, this is certainly a contrived simple example, but you can, right? AppSensor, the, this is where AppSensor, the idea, and AppSensor, the tool kind of get blended. Whatever you can think up to look for, you can. AppSensor, the tool is there to provide the kind of framework to let you do it, and we're building some canned analysis that will let you do things like this. Um, so basically what this is looking at is, or this bottom right one is, we chunked it by hour, and we all of a sudden see a spike out there. It looks different from everything else. Perfect. Um, so demo time. Let's try to make this work. Okay, so what you can't see and what I'm not going to show you um, because it is in a uh, shell and it's very, very boring is I started up a couple of, app, a couple of apps. One is, um, let's see, uh, basically a kind of a very, very dummied down version of exception gluing together. I forget the names. There's some proprietary tools that do this, commercial tools that do this where I'm using my application and instead of having to track down all the unique instances of exceptions that get thrown throughout my app, it kind of collapses it down if I signal on each exception, right? It's kind of a useful feature. I can bucket things and see what's important, that kind of thing. So I built a simple, cheap version of that. And then the second one is the actual UI, custom UI we have. So uh, one, one, sorry, it's gonna take a minute for me to learn how to drive this. Okay. Okay, these are my UI design skills, so. Uh, it's as eminently hackable if you read the homepage. I don't want anybody to remember my password, it's too easy. Okay, so try one more. 
Hopefully it's still there, perfect. Okay, so this is really, really fast demo. It's very simple. I'm just trying to show off the idea, right? So what we, what we typically, the use case we typically are looking for with AppSensor is badness and attacks. I just wanna point out, that's not the only thing you can do, right? This is a generic eventing system and based on some, some threshold, some decision, you can take some response, right? So if you wanna put this in, make it an exception tracker, fine, you can do that, right? Um, if you wanna say, if I get 500 exceptions um, in an hour, that's, that's weird. I want to uh, you know, page somebody or, or mail somebody or something, you can do that to support it. So this is the exception thing. So I come over here, when I click exceptions, what's happening in the background, right? It's really easy to throw exceptions in this application. What's happening in the background is as the as this it's a you know it's a URL and in on the back end it's uh, firing an app sensor event and then uh, triggering an exception right throwing an exception. Um, okay, so back to the other page. Yay, it worked. Um, so you mouse over these and you see the stack trace right. This is this is not exciting. It's just showing you you can have a use case. Uh, you can cover multiple use cases, and so we're bucketing each exception category. Yay. All right, so that's less useful. All right, so this is um, the peak of my UI design ability. So if you want to contribute to AppSensor, by the way, come do the UI. That's fantastic. Um, so for, for a while, we've had the complaint. Okay, you're generating this data, how do I see it? So we provide, for, most enterprises don't want our UI, right? They, they want data out and they'll stick it in whatever they want, right? Um, because they've got other systems that they, they've got to integrate with. But people who are just getting started um, have one, two, three applications on AppSensor. They do want something that they can use that's kind of out of the box. Um, so this is never meant to be a commercial product to replace everything. If people want to contribute and do that, that's fantastic. Um, but this is basically kind of to get you step one, and then if you want to integrate with other systems that can do this, fantastic. So I'm an analyst, and I can log in. Hopefully nothing breaks. Oh, it broke. Cool. Let me try that again. Uh, what is this? 8084. Ah, this is really scary big. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, that's a bit better. Everybody see the big boxes? Yes, no? Like you can see the pretty pictures. Maybe not read the words, that's okay. All right, so this is the home page. Let me, I'm just gonna literally go through what's here at a high level. So at the top, it'll let you go from the last hour, the last shift, last eight hours, uh, 24 hours, week, and month, and it will auto default to the most recent, the shortest period that has data, right? Um, and then it'll start showing you this information. Um, you know, little things like the detection points that we see the most, so you may be concerned that we're seeing a lot of whatever IE1 is, um, or we're seeing Bob do a lot of badness, so we wanna go research that, right? So we can go look at uh, Bob. Right, and Bob's doing all this. Bob, he went on a storm at this point in time for some reason. Um, so he's doing lots of different things here, and yeah, so this is kind of boring, but yeah, you can see the data. We try to group things by the category, so we'll talk about detection points in a minute, but, but briefly they are um, what type of thing you're looking for, and we have a whole page that describes kind of the buckets that we think make sense for you to, to bracket these things in, and so we bucket them that way to, to make it simpler. Um, this is a pretty picture. This is a, you know, you have to have this, any security tool has to have the scrolling thing, right? So that's there, you get that for free. Um, trends, so this page is a bit more difficult to explain, but hopefully I'll get through it without confusing you. Um, so, I probably should have terminated this and made it look a little better, but you have three options, black, red, or green, okay? So this is meant to be kind of dashboard for upper management to see I'm okay or I'm really bad. Um, so black means I'm roughly where I expect to be given my previous data. Red means I'm do I've got more attacks coming in 
than I have considering my previous data average. And green means I'm getting fewer, right? So it's pretty simple, straightforward. Again, the buckets are hour, shift, day, week, month. Um, and then the last bit that's there now, oh, sorry, I should show this. Configuration, so this is, um, this is pulling from the server. One of the things you do when you set this up is you, you're hooking it up on the, you're, you're pointing it at the server uh, that has this. So this is kind of what our configuration looks like. So you can see that, you know, we're setting up what we call client applications and we're giving them roles and all that stuff. So the more interesting bits are down here. So hopefully you can, well, you probably can't read this, but I'll, I'll help you. So we have, an, we have a detection point that we want to find that's an input validation issue. You are looking, the threshold is if I see five events in 20 seconds and the things I want to do in response to that are log, first start with logging, second log the user out, right? So that's what we can do in response. Um, it's a pretty good view of that. And the last thing is every page has to have one of these. I show you this simply because I worked on it. I don't necessarily think it adds huge value, but it is pretty. <laughs> Um, and, and I don't think any of these will pop up in the time we're watching it, but uh, these are all events but when they're yellow. Um, and yes, they will all go to the same like 10 places because I hard coded this data set, so sorry. Uh, but when it's an attack, it'll be red. And what happens is like if it's going from, you know, whatever the West Coast to South Africa, the attack will come from West Coast to South Africa, and in its place, you'll see a green one go back that says, hey, we're solving this with a response, right? So very pretty, nice colors, um, yay. Okay, so let's try to go back to the presentation if I can figure out how to do that. Okay, so I talked about this a bit, but what are we doing in the future? It's up to you. Right, what you want. Um, the things we're probably going to focus on now are trying to make more canned analysis because people need that, people want that. Uh, it needs to be simpler, right? It needs to be less work to integrate it in your applications. It's a bit of a hard problem because the sales, the, the concept behind AppSensor is you are doing things inside the application. It's not a WAF, right? Some people try to make it a WAF, but it's not a WAF. You are doing things within the application. So a WAF is never going to know that, well, not trying to. Uh, speak for the WAF vendors, but most of the WAFs I'm aware of, unless you go to uh, great lengths of training, they're not going to know that, you know, user X has access to this account and not that one, right? At least at low data sets if you, if you try to jump accounts. Um, so, and we can do that here because we have the business logic, right? So that's really a strong, st strong suit. But we need integration with frameworks. We need uh, canned analysis type things. Um, those will add value to people. Um, integrations, we do those as people ask for them. Um, and then, you know, normal stuff. You, there's plenty of things to do, so I will be here until tomorrow morning. I am open to talk until then. If you have ideas or if you want to contribute, that's great. Uh, we take code, we take documentation, we take ideas, thoughts, like this sucks, I'm fine hearing that, right? I want to do something that serves other people. Um, there's also, yeah, sorry, it's not on this slide. Um, one more who related projects. So if you're interested and AppSensor doesn't quite fit what you want, um, I will mention there are people who have used the AppSensor idea, but they've built their own custom version that just happened to, to glue into their organization a lot better. Uh, the only one I can openly mention that's done that is Mozilla. Um, and, and they built it for one specific use case and they like it, it, it works, right? Um, However, they're not using the canned reference implementation because they're a Python shop and they know Python and that's what they do, um, or at least the, the team that's doing that. Uh, so related projects. Ensnare is a Ruby on Rails implementation. So if, you're, if that's your stack, uh, this is something that the Netflix guys did. Um, I'm not saying it's a full-time supported project or anything, but it is a, um, it's probably better than a proof of concept. So <clears throat> if you're interested, go look there. They do some slightly different things than we do in addition to us. Uh, and they can do that because they're baked into the framework, right? They have tight integration, but you're not going to get other languages or other frameworks out of it, but good project to look at. Fido, or Fido, I guess, Fido I, is what I'm going to call it. Fido, perfect. Fido is a fantastic project out of Netflix that is something that they live and breathe on, on from my understanding. Um, Netflix is producing some pretty, pretty awesome stuff if you're in the space. Um, 
and uh, they've got, again, a slightly different bent, but really cool stuff. If you're interested in this space, look at it. Uh, Riemann um, is, it doesn't have the concept of the response, which makes AppSensor really, really useful, right? Based on what happens, I can respond. Excuse me. It does have the concept of response. It doesn't have the back to the application response. That makes it powerful, right? Because something else is doing my detection. It, come, it can come back to the application and I can do something with that in my application. I can lock the user, I can log them out. Uh, Riemann though is pretty slick and it does have a lot of canned integrations if you're just wanting to do monitoring type stuff. Lastly, a last alert, it's a project out of Yelp, I think, is that right? Some folks at Yelp built CAN Elastic Search searches. So if you're using Elastic Search for data, um, they built CAN security related type queries that, that are helpful there. So this is my last thing probably that I want to say. Please uh, pick whatever tool works for you, custom, app sensor, this, whatever, but use the idea if it, if it makes sense in your organization. Uh, it is powerful, it does work. It can save your people a lot of headaches and time and give you intelligence up front. Um, there's a whole list of contributors. I will not go through these, but there's a lot of people. It's on the slide deck. Um, that is me. Remember the underscore in JT Melton for Twitter if you're trying to track me down. And links. We do have a nice little micro site that gives you kind of a canned intro. And it's on GitHub. Everything's open, completely open mailing list, all that kind of thing. That's it. So questions? Yes. No. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, so AppSensor for, is for Java applications was the question. Um, so, so we get a little bit of beef on this. When App, so AppSensor came out, um, quick history, AppSensor came out as a document and like a throwaway implementation that Michael Coates admittedly says was throwaway. Um, I came into the project because I built this, something very similar because I needed it for work and I didn't know AppSensor existed. So I built it and then started looking for it because I thought it was a good idea. I was going to try to open source it. Um, didn't exist, so I offered to fix some bugs in the original implementation, and then I got an email, saw an email to the mailing list where Michael said, hey, everybody, congrats to John. He's the new dev lead. How did that happen? So I, you know, hard to say no, so I just stuck with it. Um, and five years later, here we are. So yes, it was originally Java only. It was baked in kind of as a library. And the reason for that was because it was a drop-in replacement for a SAPI, which was baked in the, the only implementation of a SAPI that I know of that people actually used was Java. Um, so it, it, SAPI had 10 whatever components and it, AppSensor was basically put this library here. It disables the original AppSensor intrusion detector and overrides it with AppSensor. Disables the SAPIs, overrides with AppSensor. Um, a couple years ago, though, uh, after I had a kid and kind of made it back, recovered from that, um, we rewrote it, threw everything away, started from scratch. So um, run back to these boxes. Um, and if we don't get through all the questions, I am here uh, tonight, tomorrow, bug me anytime. So the circle in the center is Java because that's the implementation right now. Everything else can be whatever you want it to be. So the circle in the center exposes um, communication modes is what we call them, right? So you can send me data over uh, a Kafka channel or whatever. You can send me RabbitMQ. You can make REST API queries. You can uh, set up a thrift client and send it that way. Um, so yes, the application itself is Java, but you don't need to be concerned about that. All you have to do is you whatever application you Whatever your core competency is, if you're a rail shop, if you're a go shop, whatever, right? They all support one of these communication methods or something that I can build for you. Um, and then you just send me data that way. I'll pick it up off the wire and, and do the thing with it. So yeah, whatever you want it to be, it's, it's fine. It all works. Others? Yes, no, maybe? I'm a, I'm gonna, I heard you, but I'm going to let you ask again so they get it recorded. So on the response side, I would register a response action in the XML you showed. Yep. And then do I have to provide a REST or so for Kafka API for you to call back to that? So, yeah, okay. So the, the response side, so anybody in here architects? 
Perfect. So I did have a lot of conversations with architects. I was in that world, enterprise software. So I know the challenges you're talking about, right? How do you sell this? So um, my personal recommendation, take it for what it is, right? It doesn't, it's not going to work for everybody. But if I was in an enterprise, I would pick my RabbitMQ, Kafka, whatever you want it to be. And you send me responses on one channel. Uh, I'm sorry, you send me events and attacks on one and I'll spit out responses on the other and you can, you can find out that way. You can poll if you want. I, I specifically made sure that we weren't doing like app sensor making a call back to the client application, right? Because that doesn't fly it with any architect. I'm never going to get app sensor making outbound requests back to the application. So you can poll, you can get, you know, register to the web socket, you can, but I personally like Kafka quite a bit. Um, I think the tech is strong and, and if you can get in in your org, um, it's pretty slick for a lot of the things it enables. Um, and then with Kafka, you know, anybody can register and consume, like they can roll back to the beginning and consume all of them off the wire. So you can run a batch job once a month and pick up all the events and shove them in your SIM if, you, if that's the way you want to work it. So that's my personal recommendation, but we support lots of things. Yes, no, maybe. Yes, sir. Can you consider App Sensor as a generic? Uh, not even a security vendor. So, App Sensor at its core is you send me events, right? And th those could be log events if that's what you have an interest in, but um, you send me events and I take those and make decisions about them and then I can send you, I can tell you what to do in response, right? So your architect or your team lead or, or whomever, right? Somebody who can make those decisions about how to respond, right? It's just, um, you could do it like log, for, you know, as an enhanced log for J. You can do that, right? Because logging is one of the responses you can take, um, but you can do quite a bit of other things. So, for instance, one of the integrations I provided, um, uh, sorry, trying to get the right screen. Here is Spring Security on the bottom, right? So, if you're a Spring Security user, which I am in my apps, if you're Spring, and that hence why I wrote it, if you're a Spring Security user and you signal out events, we do two things. We hook in with Spring Security because they have an eventing architecture within it. And we see when you have like, whenever you try to attempt to log in and you fail, Spring Security fires an event. That's part of its architecture. We hook that, right? We set a listener on it and we hook it and then send it off to App Sensor. Um, in addition, when you send the response back, um, you do have to have some mechanism to pull the response back, but, uh, what I did because I was using Kafka, um, I registered a, whatever they call it in spring, a startup listener or something, a lifecycle listener that would basically poll, uh, or didn't poll, it listened to a Kafka channel or whatever they call them there. And when the data came off the wire, it would check the response. And then for like, if you said log out, that is a semantic thing in spring security that I know how to handle. So I will do it for you. So if you're using spring security, and you pull in App Sensor, you can pull in the Spring security